This is the Hornada del Muerto Valley near Alamogordo, New Mexico, a place now known as White Sands Missile Test Range. It was here that America's first atomic bomb was assembled and detonated in a test codenamed Trinity. In declassifying atomic bomb testing films, the releasing agencies have deleted audio that they feel contained classified information. Despite the passage of 52 years, the Trinity footage has been sanitized in its entirety, the only test footage released without any audio at all. These sequences were filmed between July 11, 1945, when the components of the first nuclear bomb arrived at Trinity, and July 16, when the bomb was detonated. Army engineers had readied the test site over the preceding months. All that was needed was the test bomb. The large object in these scenes, the most prominent part of Gadget, as the bomb was codenamed, is the massive Dura aluminum sphere that housed the weapon itself. This is not the final shape of the finished bomb. In war use, the sphere is inserted into a 5,000 pound aerodynamic shell complete with stabilizing fins and dropped from a B-29. Seen as it is, stripped down to the essentials, Gadget looks like a small cement mixer. Gadget is attached to cables that will eventually lift the bomb to the top of a steel tower, the legs of which are visible on either sides of the scientists. The steel tower plays an important role in the Trinity test. Gadget was designed for an airburst. It will detonate in war well over 1,000 feet. But an air drop is impractical for the test. So instead, the bomb will be raised to the top of the tower and detonated at 100 feet thereby reducing fallout, if only a little. Perhaps no first in weapons design was as troubling as the first test detonation of the first nuclear bomb. The scientists were under intense strain to engineer an atomic weapon and contribute to the war effort. But what of the results? What of the yields and the effects on peoples, buildings, and cities? And what if nothing happened? Gadget itself was a perplexing weapon, a plutonium bomb that would detonate through implosion. Scientists believed that a solid core of fissionable material would explode into a chain reaction of atoms splitting atoms by rapidly compressing the material into itself. To trigger that reaction, the plutonium was formed into a ball and 5,000 pounds of explosives were wrapped around it. 32 detonators were attached to the surface to explode it simultaneously inward from all sides. What was unclear and why a test was required was if the implosion technique would work at all. The days were hot in the Alamogordo desert and final assembly was a slow process. By necessity, however, it all took place right where the bomb would be detonated, on the tower pad. Scientists had to unbolt and open the trap door on the top half of the sphere, 
and then carefully insert the plutonium core, the lens-shaped explosives, and the uranium reflectors. 5,000 pounds of high explosives were packed into the sphere, and it was volatile. Inserting the plutonium core proved to be moderately troublesome because it stuck. Scientists that they were, the solution was simply to let the temperatures of the two metals equalize, and in it went. Fine wires attached to the 32 detonators are visible in some of these scenes. On the morning of July 14th, the bomb was hoisted up the center of the tower. Foot by foot it went, moved with great care, slowly edging its way to the small shelter at the top. There, scientists attached the wire detonators to their igniters, a bank of batteries, and the various measurement assemblies were ready. Again, work proceeded diligently, but slowly. But by 5 p.m., the assembly was complete. Detonation was scheduled for 4 a.m. the next morning. Meteorologists had predicted rains for each hour, and rains there were. There was no choice but to call for a 90-minute delay. Then, at exactly 5.29 a.m. and 45 seconds, the valley was suddenly and brilliantly lit by a flash as bright as the sun. The question of a nuclear bomb was answered. The resulting fireball rose to a height of 10,000 feet. As it cleared the peaks surrounding the valley, it was seen at the Army Air Base 60 miles away. The flash, but not the fireball, was seen 120 miles away in Albuquerque and as far north as Santa Fe. At ground zero, the steel tower was vaporized and the sand was turned into a glassy green compound simply called Trinitite. I no longer consider the Pentagon a safe shelter from such a bomb, wrote General L.R. Groves, the military senior officer on Trinity. I am become death, said Robert Oppenheimer, the principal designer of the bomb. Several numbers have been calculated for the Trinity blast, but most agree that the force of the explosion was in the area of 20,000 tons of TNT, a 20 kiloton detonation. No matter what, those witnessing the event knew in an instant that World War II was indeed over.
In the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean lies the tiny coral atoll of Bikini. It is here that Joint Army-Navy Task Force One will conduct the tests with the atom bomb. Not since the discovery of gunpowder has the world wondered over the ability of man to create such an agent of destruction. Anchored in the sheltered waters of the Bikini Lagoon below is an array of almost every type of naval vessel used in the past war. Here is the venerable old carrier Saratoga, the battleship Pennsylvania, flagship of World War I. USS Nevada was designated the target ship and strategically placed. Being painted white topside would make her easier to spot from the air. This is the heavy cruiser Pensacola, the heavy cruiser Salt Lake City, and the German heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, the Jap battleship Nagato, the light carrier USS Independence can be seen on the left, the submarine Skate, attack transports, freight and cargo ships, LCIs, LCMs. A sample of almost every type of naval vessel comprises this guinea pig fleet. The decision of the target ships was based on the directive of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It required ship damage. Full of 73 ships were assembled. The densest pattern was within a thousand yard radius of the, the bomb aiming point. Ships within the 500 yard radius were secured by fixed moorings both fore and aft to prevent swinging. These were the heavy cruiser Pensacola, the destroyer Hughes, the Japanese battleship Nagato, the light carrier Independence, the submarine Skate, the concrete oiler YO-160, and the Japanese light cruiser Sakawa. Ships outside the 500-yard radius were anchored free to swing. From the 1,000 circle to the outer extremity of the target area at 4,000 yards, ships were disposed in a spoke-like pattern consisting of LSTs, LCTs, LCIs, two rows of transports, and one row of destroyers. The heavy ships lying outside the 500-yard circle were the Arkansas, New York, Saratoga, Pennsylvania, and the large German cruiser Prince Eugen. All of the target ships were loaded with ammunition and fuel oil, varying from full wartime loading to 10% of normal. A top The automatic error is almost incomprehensible to the human mind. In fact, the power of a single bomb was not too well known because there had been but three exploded, none at sea. In this 20th century world of atomic power, man is fully aware that he cannot assume an attitude of indifference to this new elemental force that he has discovered and must prepare against for its scientific mind ever known. These specialists with their strange and complicated scientific instruments will make hundreds of tests measuring temperatures, pressures, and radioactivity, and other experiments analyzing the effects of the bomb on aircraft, armament, ordnance gear, and other paraphernalia. Tied to the decks of the ships in Bikini Lagoon are samples of mechanical equipment and articles of every type and description that the Army and Navy used during the past war. Airplanes, jeeps, food, clothing, trucks, and armored cars. Everything from canned milk to tanks will be subjected to the blast. Different animals have been placed aboard the ships to substitute for military personnel. Some were shaved in order that the effects of heat and radiation on their skins could be observed and the results applied to the design of protective clothing. Numerous towers have been erected on Bikini Atoll. Within these steel structures will be housed the remotely controlled photographic electronic and other scientific instruments that will automatically record the results of the blast. Atop some of these towers, encased in huge lead vaults, cameras have been strategically placed to capture as much detail as possible. Many types of still cameras, as well as 16 and 35 millimeter motion picture cameras, shooting both black and white and color film, have been arranged to photograph the explosion during all of its phases and from every possible angle. Other towers and installations on the island 
will contain the hundreds of delicate instruments that will record data which will be invaluable for future study. In addition to the photographic equipment on land, special cameras will be used underwater. Meanwhile, on board the carriers at sea, automatic cameras are being installed in the Navy's radio-controlled drones. Photographers in other planes with aerial still and motion picture equipment will photograph the blast at various altitudes as they fly around it. Pilots and photographers receive their final instructions here from a veteran naval photographic officer. The atomic explosion will also be observed from other special aircraft. Shortly before Able Day, when the shore personnel had completed its vast and detailed preparations, Vice Admiral Blandy, in command of Joint Army-Navy Task Force One, makes a last-minute personal tour of inspection among some of the installations for radar and other setups which contain the remotely controlled cameras and television apparatus. While the Navy concentrated its efforts at Bikini, the Manhattan Project's scientists at Kwajalein were busy assembling the atomic bomb, taking special precautions to ensure its safe disposal. Ground crews indoctrinated in the procedure of handling such a weapon. A bombing crew was competitively chosen. Major Swancutt, the pilot. Major Wood, the bombardier. The B-29 Dave's Dream would carry them to the target. While the bomber is poised on the loading ramp, pilots and crews receive their final orders from an Army Air Force officer. This was a photographer's field day, and the lens experts selected for this special assignment are given last-minute instructions. The B-29 and DC-4 photographic planes bristle with cameras of every type and description. 40-inch telephoto lenses mounted on these unusual cameras resemble huge telescopes. All available sites are employed, plus some special setups never before attempted. If some cameras should miss, certainly others will get the pictures. The exposed film is to be forwarded to the Naval Photographic Science Laboratory for processing, classification, and filing, from which center it is available to all authorized agencies of Joint Task Force One. At last, the day arrived for test able. It was July 1st in Bikini, but June 30th in this country. With the atom bomb safely secured in her bomb bay, the B-29 Dave's dream roars down the runway. An anxious moment for the spectators. But the takeoff is without mishap. Everyone on Kwajalein breathes easier on learning of the bomb's departure. The huge bomber proceeds to the bikini target, escorted by the Air Force photo planes. Meanwhile, scores of other aircraft are taking their prearranged positions in the sky above the anchored ships. Some Navy fighter planes have still and motion picture cameras aboard. Others are remote-controlled drones with instruments to measure the radioactivity of the air. These will be guided through the cloud column of the explosion. More will circle the area at different altitudes and distances. Everything is in readiness now, and at last the moment has arrived. The bombing plane is nearing the target with its escort of photographic planes. At sea below on one of the ships, Secretary of the Navy Forrestal is among the observers who patient the arrival of the bomb. Sunglasses are worn by some, while others hide their eyes position. There's the target. Bomb away. There it goes. The fourth atomic bomb has been successfully detonated. First you see a blinding flash. Then comes the hemispherically shaped cloud that expands rapidly just behind the initial pressure wave. After the smoke clears, the characteristic mushroom cloud begins to form and shoot skyward. The first phase of the bomb burst produces the effect of an exploding derby hat, where the outside edge of the rim outlines the outermost front of the pressure wave at that instant. The cloudy rounded portion of the hat results from what is known as the cloud chamber effect. There is 
the ball of fire growing and rising above the clouds and smoke of the explosion. Although obscured during the first few seconds, the ball of fire is still visibly red hot. The maximum temperature reached at the center of this ball shortly after detonation exceeds even the temperature of the sun. The mushroom cloud gains altitude with amazing speed. In less than a minute, it has reached a point one mile above the Earth. Although a beautiful sight, this swirling, boiling mushroom cloud is certain death to any living thing which approaches too close to its edge. Radioactive fission particles, which resulted from the explosion, are dispersed throughout the cloud, and the deadly radiation from these particles must be avoided until the cloud is thoroughly diffused in the upper atmosphere. In this test, the Army, Navy, and civilian scientists wanted to find out just how lethal the cloud actually was at various altitudes and various distances from the center. Therefore, under the guidance of the Manhattan Project's Los Alamos Laboratories, the Army Air Forces installed specially designed filters on four of their B-17 pilotless drone planes so that an airplane could go into the very center of the cloud and bring back samples of the radioactive particles without danger to a human pilot. The Navy carried out a similar program utilizing F-6F drones based on the carrier Shangri-La. Only one drone was lost in the entire operation, although it is interesting to note that one other drone was temporarily lost for a considerable time after it had entered the smoke column because it was lifted 6,000 feet in the updraft before it could get through to the other side. As the cloud goes higher and higher, its rate of rise constantly decreases, and gradually the tremendous energy of the cloud begins to spend itself. Before the test, there was much speculation concerning the height to which the cloud would rise. Some predicted it might equal the 60 to 70,000 foot altitude reached by the previous Nagasaki cloud. However, at Bikini, the atomic cloud pushed itself to approximately 40,000 feet in a period of 10 minutes and stopped there. Explanation for failure to go higher lay in three facts. First, the atmosphere at Bikini was so wet that a considerable part of the cloud energy was absorbed by the moisture in the air. Second, the bomb was exploded close enough to the surface of the water to permit a certain part of the energy to be transformed into steam by a quenching action. And third, there were no large-scale fires, such as those encountered in burning Nagasaki, to feed the column after its initial rise. After the blast wave from the atomic explosion has spent itself, a reverse or suction wave is created as the air rushes back to the point of burst to fill the vacuum created there. As this air is heated in the vicinity of the fireball, it mixes and rises with the cloud column. Consequently, more air must keep coming into the center of the column, thus causing the effect you see in these pictures of the ship array, where the air rushing into the center of the cloud column carries with it the smoke of the burning ship. In order to obtain complete photographic records, photo aircraft pursued the cloud and took pictures of it as long as possible while it drifted slowly to the southwest. Gradually, it became diffused to such a degree that the chase had to be abandoned. One thing was certain, however. The dangerous radioactive particles in the cloud had become so widely scattered that no longer was there any danger to the surrounding area. In just a moment, you will see two views of the atomic bomb explosion taken from the observer ships approximately 20 miles from Bikini Lagoon. The second view provides another excellent example of the cloud chamber effect, which is produced for a very simple reason. The atmosphere of Bikini was almost saturated on July 1st, and when the pressure wave hit the air, it was compressed and heated. After the pressure front passed, the resultant expansion of the air cooled it below saturation point and caused formation of the expanding fog cloud you have seen in each view of the explosion.
mounted atop a 100-foot tower on Bikini Island, over three miles from the point of burst. On the water, you can see the shock wave coming toward the camera. Watch those palm trees in the foreground. The next three views of the burst were taken by other automatic cameras on top of towers located on other nearby islands in the lagoon. These cameras were started in motion by remote control radio signals emanating from aboard laboratory ships many miles away. notice in two of the scenes that a timing watch has been placed within view of the camera in order to afford the scientists a means of studying the speed relationships of the various phases of this explosion. The epicenter of the detonation of the bomb was approximately 650 yards from the USS Nevada at this point. The transports Gilliam and Carlisle, the destroyers Lamson and Anderson, and the Japanese cruiser Sakawa were sunk. The following ships sustained serious damage. Nevada, Independence, Salt Lake City, Skate, Y-O-160, L-E-M number one, Pensacola, Arkansas, L-S-T-52, Crittenden, and the A-R-D-C. The next ships to be seen were only slightly damaged. Nagato, Banner, Pennsylvania, Skipjack, Apagon, Parch, Butte, Dawson, Prince Eugen, Wilson, Stack, Rhine, Brule, Hughes, and the LCT-874. These were the first pictures taken from surface craft, which made their way into the target area as soon as the danger from radioactivity had passed. The three ships visible here are an APA, the Salt Lake City, and the Independence. The smoke from the light carrier Independence is from burning torpedo warheads in the torpedo stowage on the hangar deck. In the foreground, numerous salvage tugs and radiological reconnaissance vessels are taking water samples from the lagoon for testing. We see the Nevada, Nagato, Saratoga, troop transports, freight and cargo ships, and other vessels in the array as the camera sweeps across the target fleet. This ship, the USS Pennsylvania, was about 1,800 yards from the epicenter of the bomb blast. Wreckage was slight and limited to minor superstructure damage. The fire burning amidships was in supply samples stowed on this deck and was not of a serious nature. In the background, a salvaged tug is seen fighting a small fire on the heavy cruiser Salt Lake City. This ship, the USS Saratoga, was about 2,600 yards from the epicenter. The only damage sustained was a small fire topside and a minor operating mechanism of one of the airplane elevators. The Prince Eugen was about 1,700 yards from the epicenter. This ship sustained minor topside damage only. This is the USS Pennsylvania again, after the fire had been extinguished. This view shows her starboard side, which was away from the blast, and which sustained topside damage aft. This ship, the Japanese battleship Nagato, 
was about 850 yards from the epicenter. Damage was limited to topside fixtures and superstructure, which were considerably battered and broken. And the epicenter sustained only slight damage topside. Inspecting the damage to the ship is the Secretary of the Navy and high-ranking officers. In the foreground is a shattered mirror which had been placed on the deck along with other equipment to be tested. This troop transport received extensive superstructure damage. The smokestacks, radio and radar antenna and supports, together with various other light topside structures, were broken or buckled. These animals survived the blast, but died later from the effect of radioactivity. This ship, the USS Nevada, was about 650 yards from the epicenter. These pictures were taken from the side nearest the blast and show the superstructure wreckage. The paint on this side was scorched, but did not burn. shows a portion of the unarmored deck aft, which was pushed down by the explosion. Aircraft and quartermaster supplies placed on this deck were considerably damaged. The next ship is the concrete oiler YO-160 which was located about 400 yards from the epicenter. The concrete hull was undamaged, but the superstructure was almost completely demolished. This ship, the USS Arkansas, was about 650 yards from the epicenter and sustained extensive damage to topside fixtures and superstructure. cruiser Salt Lake City was 1,000 yards from the epicenter. Superstructure wreckage was considerable. Both stacks were wrecked, and antenna and other fixtures were bent over or broken. The heavy cruiser Pensacola was located about 450 yards from the epicenter. This ship sustained serious superstructure wreckage. Both stacks were a total wreck, and numerous other topside structures were badly damaged. The submarine skate was located about 300 yards from the epicenter. The light fixtures, periscopes, and superstructure were demolished, but the pressure hull and conning tower remained intact and interior machinery was undamaged. The Japanese light cruiser Sakawa was located about 150 yards from the epicenter of the bomb burst. This cruiser was heavily damaged topside, and the hull ruptured aft, causing her to slowly flood. Although the Sakawa was commissioned only 18 months ago, she is considered by the Japanese to be a victory model and is not of modern construction. The hull, for example, was entirely riveted. Her superstructure, aft of the midships and above the main deck, was completely demolished. She capsized to port and sank the day following the bomb burst. This is the light carrier Independence, which was about 600 yards from the epicenter. This ship was severely damaged by the primary blast action of the bomb. The blast struck the Independence on the port side, blew in the light side plating between the hangar and flight decks, and pushed up the center of the flight deck like a rooftop.
both airplane elevators were blown up and overboard. The top of the island was completely blown off. Gun sponsons and guns on the port side were severely damaged. The watertight integrity of the hull remained intact. No fires occurred except among the torpedoes on the hangar deck aft. This class carrier was built on a basic cruiser type hull. The port side external plating was light blister shell plating and became deeply fluted between longitudinal frames as a result of the bomb burst. Similarly, the hangar deck plating is a light false deck built over the heavier hangar deck. Damage to the starboard side, away from the blast, was less severe. Although damage to some of these ships is impressive, it must be remembered that these experiments are not a contest between bombs and ships, but an earnest effort to determine what changes must be made in the future design and construction of ships, dispersion of bases, tactics and strategy, in this new age of atomic power. Able Day. The period between the test Able date of 1 July and the test Baker date of 25 July was an extremely busy one for the technical and scientific personnel attached to Joint Task Force 1. During this time, the immense task of making detailed and comprehensive inspections and the recording of data resulting from test Able was completed. And in addition, the entire target ship array was reoriented. The basic premise which determined the target ship orientation for Test Baker was the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive requiring that the ships be so disposed as to secure graded damage from maximum to minimum. The primary purpose of Test Baker was to secure precise ship damage and instrumentation measurements resulting from an atomic bomb explosion just under the surface of the water. Of the 84 target vessels, 40 ships were placed within one mile of the bomb detonation point, and 20 ships were placed within one half mile. The obsolete Arkansas and carrier Saratoga were secured fore and aft by fixed moorings, presenting their full length to the explosion in order that maximum damage would be ensured. The Arkansas was placed about 250 yards from the bomb, and the Saratoga about 700. These distances were carefully estimated so that at least one, and probably both of these heavy ships, would be deliberately sunk. In order to properly determine the shock effect of the underwater explosion against submerged submarine hulls, six of these craft were suspended underwater at varying depths. These pictures show the operation of submerging the skipjack. The method used was to secure heavy concrete mooring blocks to each boat. Buoyancy tanks were then slowly flooded until the concrete blocks rested on the bottom of the lagoon. Varying lengths of chain were used between the concrete blocks and the six submarines in order to hold each boat at its desired depth. Two additional submarines were left on the surface, one of which was the skate, damaged in test able. In test baker, Photographic procedure was similar to that followed in Test Able. Many types of cameras, and especially motion picture cameras, were encased in huge lead vaults atop photographic towers erected on three islands in the lagoon. All of these cameras operate automatically. These specially designed enclosures built of reinforced concrete to withstand the shock of the primary blast action 
are lined with thick sheets of lead to protect against radiation from the bomb burst, which would otherwise fog sensitive films. To further protect the film from the effects of radiation, sliding lead panels built over the camera ports and designed to close automatically will seal the vaults, making radioactive penetration impossible. Flown from Ronjerich to witness the historical event is King Judah, ruler of Bikini. It was he who unselfishly gave his island to the United States in order that these experiments could be conducted. King Judah has been invited aboard the command ship of Operation Crossroads to meet Vice Admiral Blandy. The LSM-60 was designated as the target suspension vessel for the Baker Day test. The equivalent of a bomb bay was cut in the tank deck, and through this opening, the bathysphere carrying the atomic bomb was lowered into the sea. The bomb was held at the desired depth until detonation by means of specially designed winches. When everything was in readiness aboard the LSM-60, the scientists and military personnel left the ship and a careful check was made of their departure so that no stragglers were left. The signal flag yoke was too blocked on the halyards indicating that no personnel were aboard. After Dr. Warner fused the bomb, Rear Admiral Parsons, Deputy Commander for Technical Direction, took a last look at the LSM and went over the side into a waiting picket boat. Having left the target array, the Admiral comes aboard the USS Mount McKinley, flagship of Operation Crossroads. Everything has been placed in readiness, and he submits his report to Vice Admiral Blandy. Aboard the firing ship USS Cumberland Sound, members of the Los Alamos group of the Manhattan Engineer District enter the timing laboratory, where radio transmitters and specially constructed instruments for detonating the bomb are located. The timing laboratory scientists pass into the master control room. Dr. Marshall Holloway, leader of the Los Alamos group, unlocks and personally throws one of the master transmitter switches. The timing laboratory is a complex interlocking system of radio transmitters, time recorders, and scientific apparatus. As each hour approaches, generators are started, transmitters warmed up, graph cards on time recorders changed, and everything made ready for the blast. Each hour minus two minutes is broadcast from the ship, and all hands stand by. Sitting in the central console switchboard with the microphone is Dr. Ernest Titterton, assistant to Dr. Halloway. As he announces H hour minus 30 seconds, Dr. Halloway throws the 30 second switch. Dr. Titterton at the automatic firing panel board prepares to broadcast the last 15 seconds. 15. Ten, five, four, three, two, one, fire.
blast is photographed from the Mount McKinley, and King Judah displays a marked interest in the proceedings. These pictures of the ascending water column show the expanding cloud of spray at the base of the column moving outward and enveloping the ships in the target array. Great quantities of radioactive water from the column descended upon the decks of the nearby vessels, and ship hulls a mile away were drenched by the wall of foaming water. Here is an Army Air Force drone approaching the cloud column. Still another view of the explosion, recorded from a photographic tower on Bikini, shows the column composed of millions of tons of water rising at an initial rate exceeding the speed of sound. The water and spray from the explosion will fall for several minutes. Here again is an excellent photographic portrayal of the boiling, foaming wall of water engulfing the ships in the foreground. This highly lethal spray was intensely radioactive partly by reason of the neutron bombardment of the sodium in the salt contained in seawater. It is estimated that radioactivity immediately following the burst was equal to hundreds of tons of radium. An expanding cloud of spray and fog several hundred feet high may be seen moving out from the center of the detonation. This cloud eventually covered the entire target array. Waves outside the water column, about 1,000 feet from the center of the explosion, were 80 to 100 feet in height. These waves rapidly diminished in size as they proceeded outward, when reaching Bikini had a height of approximately 7 feet. Visible on the surface of Bikini Lagoon is an oil slick, leaking from ruptured oil tanks, principally from the battleship Arkansas. Three major ships were sunk. The Arkansas immediately, the aircraft carrier Saratoga after seven and a half hours, and the Japanese battleship Nagato after five days. Several small craft were also sunk. Immediately after the burst, radiological reconnaissance drones were sent into the lagoon. Despite the presence of radioactive contamination, Radiological safety patrols immediately entered the lagoon for a preliminary appraisal of the damage. Landing parties armed with Geiger counters which register any unsafe concentration of radioactive particles go ashore at Bikini to recover the camera film and the data recorded by the scientific instruments. Meanwhile, an inspecting party headed by Admiral Blandy, General Kepner, and Admiral Parsons surveyed the damage in the target array. Shown here is the Japanese battleship Nagato, which flooded and capsized five days after the blast. The light carrier Independence sustained severe superstructure damage in Test Able, and no additional apparent topside damage was visible after Test Baker. the heavy cruiser Salt Lake City, the destroyer Hughes in sinking condition was beached, the Saratoga sustained heavy underwater hull damage and listed badly. Other ships surviving the Baker Day blast were the submarine Skate, the submarine Pilot Fish, the heavy cruiser Pensacola, a troop transport and a small yard oiler. The Saratoga taking on more and more water slowly sinks stern first. The operation of Joint Army Navy Task Force One in conducting the tests has set a pattern for close, effective cooperation of the armed services and civilian scientists 
in the planning and execution of this highly technical operation. It has also provided valuable training of personnel in joint operations requiring great precision and coordination of efforts. This preliminary photographic report has covered the period of time through Baker plus one day.